This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. So um, our next panel now is, uh, and, and our last sort of formal big panel of, of our conference uh, is about discrimination. And uh, very excited again, a very uh, distinguished group of folks here on the panel. Um, following on Lee's opening of the, of the prior panel, in 2001, there were 13 states and DC, including DC, that had laws that prohibited discrimination based on sexual orientation, and two had laws that uh, included gender identity. And today, it's 22 states um, that prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation, and 14 of those um, include gender identity. So again, a, a, a period of, of a lot of change in this arena. So so our uh, moderator for this panel is Chai Fellbloom, and we're very excited uh, that the government didn't shut down. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that would have changed your being here or not, but <laughs> so um, Chai was uh, appointed by President Obama as the as a commissioner um, of the U.S. Equal. Employment Opportunity Commission, and um, she's a professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center. Uh, she found, there she founded the Law Center's Federal Legislation and Administrative Clinic, a program designed to train students to become legislative lawyers. Um, she's a co-director there of Workplace Flexibility 2010, and has worked to advance flexible workplaces in a manner that works for employees and employers. And um, it, for those of you who don't of this, if you go back a little bit in history, Hi played a very important, in fact, leading role in drafting the groundbreaking Americans in, uh, dis in yeah, Americans <laughs> with Disabilities Act, uh, which was uh, enacted in 1990. So I will turn it over to Hi. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody, and I want to. Um, congratulate the Williams Institute and Chuck Williams um, and Stu is partner was here to um, uh, really congratulate Williams Institute on a phenomenal 10 years of work and as I think the last panel showed <laughs> yes um, in fact, I think you'd know, you know you've made it at the Williams Institute when um, I think the White House is going to start asking people um, are there any videos of you at the Williams Institute? <laughs> because that is what they asked me about, was there any videos of me at Creating Change? And I said, no, you know, saying anything problematic. I'm like, no, because I hadn't been to Creating Change in, in ages at that point. Um, meantime, the video that the, the religious right put onto YouTube was one for me here at the Williams Institute about four years ago, talking in the way that we had, we heard in the last panel from Mignon about the importance of dealing in your communities, talking about gay sexuality is morally good, which is what I was talking about, and somehow some people thought that was problematic. I can't imagine why. Um, all right, well, I am thrilled to be able to moderate this um, great panel on um, discrimination and how we're gonna end it. Um, and as a segue from the last panel to this one, um, I would urge people to read Kathleen Gerson's book called The Unfinished Revolution, how a new generation is reshaping family, work, and gender. Be, uh, Kathleen Gerson is a sociologist at NYU, and, and maybe in a few years she can be here in a panel um, talking about uh, maybe expanding her views to, to some of the um, same-sex couples' issues. But her book was dealing with the fact that people think about family structure as two parents, single parents, and really what was more important was the relationship between gender, work, and family, and that whether people had good jobs and how they could do those jobs and how both parents being able to do jobs and family was much more important than some other issues that people thought was important. Well, that requires having a job in the first place. If you don't have a job, lots of other things won't follow. 
So this panel is going to talk about what we know and don't know in terms of research right now, in terms of both transgender people and gay people and work and the intersection between laws prohibiting discrimination and some outcomes. So I'm not gonna repeat anyone's bio, I'm gonna introduce people basically as they start, okay? Um, and we're gonna start with Jody Herman. Now, let me just say before you stand up, <laughs> because we're gonna do a little more Williams Institute celebration here, right? We have those three aspects, celebrate. Jody Herman is currently a public policy fellow at the Williams Institute, has a PhD in public policy and public administration from GW, um, and her dissertation, and I hope this is gonna be a reflection of the newer generation not being afraid of having the dissertation be on gay and transgender issues, um, was on the development of anti-discrimination protection for transgender and gender non-conforming people. Um, but she's gonna talk about um, some of the uh, current research we have on discrimination against transgender folks. But before she starts, because everyone who has been or is currently a fellow from the Williams Institute, either public policy or law, would you please stand up? Okay. Look at the people that we are putting out into the academy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Williams Institute and Jody, as a representative of this wonderful group. Oh, my. No pressure. Okay. Thank you very much for that introduction and, and no pressure. I don't really want to be representing all the fellows. Um, Okay, so my name is Jody Herman. I'm the um, Peter J. Cooper Public Policy Fellow at the Williams Institute. I joined the Williams Institute last fall, and it's an exciting time to be here, um, not only because of the 10th anniversary and that I get to work with the Williams Institute research team, which is expanding, um, but also as a researcher whose focus is on gender identity and the T in LGBT, the Williams Institute has supported and is supporting cutting edge research with the trans community, such as through the small grants program. And by tackling the challenge of survey question design to collect transgender status and gender nonconformity in general population surveys, um, just to name a couple of things, and there are more great things to come. Um, but before joining, joining the Williams Institute, I began work as a consulting researcher on the National Transgender Discrimination Survey Project. And today, I will present some of the findings on employment discrimination that are highlighted in the report, Injustice at Every Turn. And I hope it will demonstrate the real life stakes um, involved in eliminating employment discrimination and also why the 2007 ENDA debates left such a bitter taste in the mouths of some of the members of the trans community. Um, so first off uh, about methodology, the survey was a 70 item questionnaire, which is very long, and they wondered if anyone would answer it because it's so long, but we got uh, over 7,500 initial responses. Um, it covered a variety of topics and collected data on respondents' experiences based on their status as transgender or gender nonconforming. Um, the survey was announced through listservs, participating organizations, and by word of mouth. It was fielded from September 2008 through February of 2009. And like I said, more than 7,500 people filled out the survey um, with a final sample of nearly 6,500 valid responses from people identifying as transgender or gender nonconforming. Um, and as far as I know, it's the largest US sample of transgender and gender nonconforming people to date. So this was a convenient sample, not a random sample. And these types of studies um, are based largely on convenient sample, uh, convenient samples, studies that um, collect data on trans and gender nonconforming people because gender identity and gender nonconforming status are not included in US general population surveys. Um, Gary Gates recently provided a population estimate of the trans community, which is helpful, but of course, uh, much more work needs to be done, and I'm excited to work with Gary on issues of data collection on um, trans identity and gender nonconformity. Um, I thought this would be interesting to show. Um, the survey included an opportunity for respondents to write in 
um, gender identity terms that they use to describe themselves. Um, so this graphic displays the relative frequency of the individual words that people entered into that field. Um, so the larger the term, the more frequently it was used. So you see woman, man, male, and female were used a lot, but there's a whole constellation of identities that were represented in the survey. And this demonstrates um, not only the great diversity in gender identities that are out there, but also the difficulty in designing survey questions that try to capture this in a succinct manner. <laughs> um, it's uh, pretty difficult. Um, people do have uh, very diverse identities. Um, so uh, you can see here there's, there's two maps here, and uh, the map on the left displays the uh, where the survey respondents came from, and the map on the right shows the population density of the United States. So I think the um, uh, respondents came from all 50 states and the District of Columbia, and also Puerto Rico, Guam, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. So I think one can take away from here that transgender and gender nonconforming people live everywhere. and. No legislator should think that there's not trans and gender nonconforming people amongst their constituents. Um, so let's go into some of the findings. So the survey asked about experiences respondents had based on their status as trans or gender nonconforming in all of these categories. Um, and respondents reported dis experiencing discrimination throughout all of them. But today I want to um, focus on the major findings in employment. So one of the, ma the, the major finding in the employment section was that 90% of respondents um, reported experiencing uh, harassment, mistreatment, discrimination, and discrimination in employment, or they hid who they were to try to avoid these things. And this 90% figure was based on a whole battery of questions um, that, so the 90% includes people who uh, had one or more of certain experiences, and I'll, I'll show a breakdown of that. So for instance, 26% um, of respondents had reported that they lost a job due to anti-transgender bias. 44% believe they were not hired for a job due to anti-transgender bias. 44% um, believe they were underemployed. Um, I, I won't go through the entire laundry list, but um, I, I think these are very startling uh, statistics that we should all take note of when we're thinking about anti um, discrimination and employment protections. Um, this, this is a graph I pulled from the report that shows um, unemployment rates and breaks it down by race. So the general population unemployment rate at the time of the survey was 7%. Our survey sample reported 14% unemployment. And then when you look at the racial categories, um, uh, black African American respondents were about double the survey sample rate and about what was that quadruple the general population rate, um, and also American Indians, uh, Latino and Latina respondents, and multiracial respondents were also higher than the survey um, sample as a whole. Um, this shows uh, the income of respondents and the income of the U.S. general population. Um, I think it's it's notable to show that the survey sample seems to be overrepresented in the lower income categories, especially in the lowest, which is uh, at 15 percent, whereas at the time the, the general population was at 4 percent in the lowest income category. Um, 16, so here are some additional findings, and I'll, I'll close soon. I know I'm running out of time. Um, 16% of respondents said that they had worked in the underground economy, and the underground economy includes uh, things such as so sex work and drug sales. Um, but then when you factor in employment, it looks that, uh, like employment has a kind of a, a large impact on um, negative uh, indicators, negative outcomes. So for instance, um, when you compare, compare people who were currently unemployed at the time of the survey versus currently employed, um, people who were unemployed reported double the rate of participation in the underground economy, higher rates of incarceration, nearly double the rate of HIV infection, and double the use of alcohol and drugs. 
and the fi those findings are very similar when you look at people who reported that they had lost a job due to anti-transgender bias uh, compared to those who believe they had not lost a job due to anti-transgender violence. You, you see, again, double the rate of uh, participation in the underground economy, double the rate of HIV infection, nearly double the rate of um, alcohol and drug use. Um, so clearly in the sample, employment plays an important role in the lives of respondents, and unemployment and job loss may have devastating effects on people's lives. So I, today, I just have merely scratched the surface of all the findings in this report. Of course, we covered a lot of different areas, um, and those are just the highlights from the employment section. I, I would encourage everyone who is interested to go to the website, uh, www.ntransdiscrimination.org, to view the full report, and I believe we have copies somewhere, I'm Randy. Hopefully he has put them out. We've uh, had copies of the executive summary if you want to take those with you, but the full report is, is very long, so we didn't provide copies of that, but you can go online and, and check it out. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Jody, and, and really thanks to the, the, I know a number of the people who were involved in that study, and it was an incredibly uh, well done, rigorous, and in fact is essential in terms of policy making to start with data of that kind. But the other place in which policy can be helped is not even so much the quantitative data, but the theoretical constructs behind um, issues of gender and work. And um, I'm very pleased that we have Kristin Schilt speaking next, an associate professor of sociology at University of Chicago. And as you can see from the short bio um, about Professor Schilt, she published a monograph last year on the experiences of transgender men in the workplace and how those experiences can help illuminate the organizational processes that contribute to the persistence of inequality in the workplace. So both speaking from that perspective as well as how law and policy can uh, interact, um, Professor Schill. I'm gonna stay here, so I'll excuse us. Well, thank you so much for having me as one of the only qualitative researchers here. I'm very excited to be included, so thank you very much. Um, in the late 2000s, newspapers and websites across the country ran articles with titles such as, Will Bathroom Bill Get Flushed by Conservatives? The so-called bathroom bill refers to state and federal attempts to include gender identity and gender expression in public accommodations and employment. Such protections would offer some legal recourse for transgender people who faced workplace discrimination, and they're often called transgender rights bills. Now, currently, as I'm sure we all know, there are no federal uh, protections for transgender people, and such protections would be encapsulated in the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, or INDA. As Gary pointed out, there's still a, you know, there's a handful of states, 14, that do have state laws, um, more cities and counties, and some employers. But a federal INDA would make a big difference for transgender workers because they would be covered. They wouldn't be at the mercy of where they lived or who they worked for. But opponents to these bills have really changed the terms of the debate from being about discussion of rights and discrimination to being more of a moral panic about gender and sexuality. And the media has actually really picked up this bathroom bill moniker, and it's, it's generated a lot of opposition to these bills. It's actually been quite successful as well. So what I'm gonna do in this talk is build on some of Jody's ideas and continue to make a case about why such bills are so important. And I'm gonna discuss some of the broad findings from my qualitative research. And I'm gonna end with some ideas about what I think is needed in terms of research to really get uh, some more social change in this area. So I've been studying, I can't believe I'm gonna say this, the workplace experiences of transgender workers for almost 10 years. Um, I started in 2003. My first book uh, was about transgender men and I looked at their experiences in day-to-day -day workplace experiences in California and Texas. And I'm doing a similar project right now with transgender women. Uh, I looked at trans men who worked in a variety of occupations, so retail, blue collar, professional, and whenever possible, I also asked to interview coworkers and employers to see how they made sense of um, having a transgender colleague. And I looked at people who transitioned and stayed in the same jobs and people who got new jobs where no one knew that they were transgender. And just in the interest of time, I'm only going to talk about people who were known to be transgender at work, but I can say more in the q and I also did an analysis of transgender employment legal cases from the 1970s to the present. 
I attended for six years transgender conferences across the country and went to all the workplace panels to see what was happening nationally. And then I did a uh, questionnaire with trans men and trans women about salaries before and after transition. So I'm going to start with some of the challenges that people are facing in their day-to-day -day lives in the workplace. In some cases, there is overt discrimination. And this was more common in Texas, where there is no state law and very few city and county laws protecting transgender workers. And in these cases, um, I'll just give an example. Tex, um, one of my respondents, worked in a summer program for children, which he'd worked in for many years and had a great relationship with his boss. But when he approached him about potentially transitioning, his boss said, no way. He said, look, if any of the kids or the parents think you're gay or transgender, you don't have a job here. He added, you do what you need to do. I respect you. But this is a business, and that, a transition, it just doesn't work here. But more often, it was more what we might call passive aggressive or covert, that employers would express some sort of tentative support and then begin to behave in unsupportive ways without acknowledging that they were doing this. So Winston's boss said, well, I don't know, maybe, I'll see what I can do. But then his next performance evaluation was negative. And he said, look, I saw what was coming, and my professional reputation meant more to me than keeping that job. And these kinds of passive-aggressive or covert reactions were very common in the legal cases, where you would see someone go from you know, a 20-year exemplary record to being fired for something like clocking out a minute early or misusing email protocol. Um, so it was never named that they were being fired for being transgender, but it was implied. Some employers offered to keep trans men on, but only if they agreed to work as women. So Caleb was hired by a major retail company known for its non-discrimination policy for sexual orientation. And he was really excited, thinking that this would signal that they would also be supportive of transgender workers. But after coming out as transgender to his boss, he was never put on the schedule. When he called to ask why, his boss told him, we have a policy that any male who works here can't wear women's clothing, and any woman who works here can't wear men's clothing. And as he was still legally female on his government documents, he counted as a woman, and therefore was considered a cross-dresser. He faced two choices he found equally coercive, wear women's clothing or get a new job. Now, in looking at these challenges, there were some contexts that were um, particularly problematic for trans men. So retail jobs, for example, were more likely to be somewhat precarious. And also, um, transgender men who worked in LGBT-related organizations were often the most unsatisfied with the support that they received from their colleagues. And I can talk a little bit more about that in the Q&A. But not all experiences are negative, and I think it's really important to point this out, that we don't hear as much about the successes. Um, and I think it's important to really analyze when things go well, why do they go well, and how can we try to replicate that. So in many cases, coworkers were incredibly supportive and inclusive, went out of their way to educate themselves about transgender issues, sometimes took on the role of what people called pronoun police, where they reminded other people to change pronouns, which is very appreciated. And when I interviewed coworkers, I was interested in, well, where does the support come from? Uh, most of them knew very little about anything related to transgender issues. Sometimes they'd seen something on TV, like Discovery Health Channel or something like that, but they had very little information coming in. Um, across the board, when they were supportive, it was often because they attributed it to something innate or biological. So it was very important for them to say, you know, this person was trapped in the wrong body. This was a biological error that did this to him. Um, you know, he has to change in order to be who he is, but really seeing it, again, as biological. They often medicalized it, so they would compare it to things like, well, it's like if you had a birth defect or if you had cancer. Um, and it was also very important for them to see this person's life pre-transition as very tragic, right? So no matter if their colleagues said, oh, I had a great life, I was perfectly happy before, they were like, well, that's what he said, but I think <laughs> it would be really, really tragic. Um, and you know, one of the funnier things that came out is men coworkers, um, when I asked people, did you have any questions you wanted to know, they almost always said, well, I was really interested about genital surgery because I'm interested in science. So they always added that they had a scientific interest in genital surgery. Uh, but this biological argument could also be somewhat problematic, that in seeing something as biological, coworkers really made it individual, right? So they didn't want to think about transgender rights or community. They wanted to think about this one person. So as one coworker said, you know, I was really glad he didn't make it a political issue. Right, so it was something that it was okay for one person, but they didn't want to think about having to really rethink what, you know, the gender binary or something like that. Uh, for bosses and employers, um, their support is really key for success. Top-down support from bosses really is what makes an open workplace transition go well. So if the boss immediately says, look, I don't really know a lot about it, but I'll figure it out. We're going to handle this. I'm going to tell everyone how to respond, and I'm going to have a no, you know, no tolerance policy for harassment. That's when you start to see coworkers kind of fall in line. 
Um, if the boss says, you can do this, but I don't know what's going to happen to you, like I can't really control how people are, that's when coworkers take the signal that no one's going to stop them if they do want to behave badly. And just touching a little bit on what we talked about yesterday, um, having an evangelical coworker was often um, problematic, that they were, they were much less able to be reined in by the employer. Having an evangelical boss was particularly problematic, that that was one that did not work out very well and often happened in Texas. But <laughs> even with this top-down support, I think it's important to emphasize that the problem is workplace experiences are precarious. So if you have a supportive boss who leaves, you're suddenly at the mercy of whoever comes in. And that's why these federal protections are so important. So where to go from here? I would say we need more research. We need quantitative research, but we also need qualitative research. We need to know when things go well, why do they go well? And I think qualitative work can really help there. And I'd also say we need longitudinal research, that workplace experiences change a lot over a trajectory. We need to see how that happens. And then I would say we need more data on not just transgender workers, but also on their employers and coworkers. We know very little right now about how people who are not transgender understand the transition process and what they even think that term means. And I'm going to end with a short example about why I think this is so important. Um, as Jody referenced, in 2007 there was another big debate about whether or not INDA should include sexual orientation and transgender protections or just sexual orientation. Representative Barney Frank made a case for omitting these so-called transgender protections, saying the U.S. public had more familiarity with gays and lesbians and it would be easier to get a bill with just sexual orientation passed. And as a social scientist, this is the kind of claim that drives me crazy because we don't actually have any evidence about what the U.S. public thinks about transgender people. Um, so when I was a postdoc at Rice University at the time, and I convinced them to put on some questions for their Houston area survey to see what response we would get. And what we found was that 52% of respondents said that homosexuality was immoral, and 52% of respondents said that gender transitions were immoral, the same 52%. So to counter Frank's argument, our data suggested that if someone has a strong opposition to one, they have a strong opposition to the other. And it's this opposition that's really leading this whole bathroom bill kind of foray. Uh, we have 30 years of attitudinal data, more than 30 years, on gays and lesbians. We need similar kinds of questions about transgender people. Um, I'm currently, I've just tested out some questions I'm trying to get on the general social survey and working on getting funding and things like that. But I really hope other people will respond to this challenge because I think this kind of work is really important in terms of, get, of shaping policy and really understanding attitudes in order to get social change. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I um, hope the audience has noticed that we actually started this panel with transgender issues instead of you know, sexual orientation, and then tag on transgender issues. Um, and um, I, uh, I think that that's also important as a legal matter. Um, you heard Kristen say that um, there's no federal protection for transgender people, or people often say no federal protection for transgender and gay people. As the lawyers in the room know, of course, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, actually, the gender component of um, federal law is uh, something that is quite robust in the courts and something that the lawyers are continuing to um, work with. Um, so, um, you know, the, there's important in terms of there is some protection in certain situations, um, but it's important to make clear the level of discrimination that exists so that one understands the importance of having a clear law like, um, like ENDA in terms of protection. Well, one of the other main things about ENDA, um, oh, and you're not, where's Lee? You were, oh, I didn't see you. I was like, oh my God, there was like this blank. <laughs> Lee was going next, and I'm like, where is Lee? <laughs> um, Lee Badgett, of course, needs no introduction for this group, but I will tell you that when um, ENDA was first introduced uh, 17 years ago, I figured it out here. I often say I don't have kids, I have laws, you know, and the ADA was my first. <laughs> The difference between laws and kids is that sometimes laws just stay in utero a really long time. Um, so uh, 17 years ago, when uh, ENDA was introduced, um, and I testified in 1994 and then again in 1996, one of the key arguments was you need no such law because you are all latte drinking, NPR listening people. Um, and uh, Lee's work at the time was one of the, the few pieces that really started to get 
into the class and income issues of, um, of uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual people. So we are now going to move to now expand the panel to sexual orientation and class and income issues, and starting with Lee. So, well, thank you uh, for that introduction. This is, uh, I, I want to point something else out, too, about the last two um, folks who were presenting, which is that uh, we're also, you know, a big tent when it comes to methods, because I think it is important to look at questions from many different angles to understand all the subtleties. And um, so it's exciting to, to be able to have both the survey research and the, and the quanti qualitative research, which is so important. And I'm mainly going to talk about some of the uh, quantitative research, just to go back to that, in the um, context of employment discrimination, um, mostly related to sexual orientation. Um, and uh, just kind of tell you, though, that this reflects both the really good things and the really bad things about economists, um, which is that we like to go into things very deeply. We you know, tweak our methods. We sort of make sure that findings are robust to different methods and adding new variables and different data sets. But it turns out that a lot of times the downside of that is you, the good side is you get a you know a nice scientific study of of what uh, the evidence of discrimination is. The downside is that sometimes the studies don't really change very much over time. So I'm going to try to give you an update of what we do have. But I want to first start off by saying uh, that the Williams Institute um, has been developing kind of a new a new program, I guess I would call it, that is. Um, trying to look at this evidence of discrimination in the context of states. Uh, to be able to do this at a state level um, uh, is very important because a lot of people just don't believe that discrimination exists. So it seems pretty basic to just kind of present these numbers. But again and again, we just hear these questions, does the discrimination exist? Um, and there was a monumental effort a couple of years ago to produce data from 50 states uh, related to ENDA. I won't go into the details, but uh, Brad Sears, Nan Hunter, and Christy Mallory, and Lori Hazenkamp spent, I don't know, like their whole lives, their whole waking lives working on this one year. And uh, But the nice thing is we have lots of new data to kind of mine. So in the last uh, year or so, we've done three state-level reports. You're not really supposed to be able to read these. Uh, one, is for, <laughs> one is for Oklahoma. One is for South Dakota, and one is for Utah. Now, what's different about those states? We don't normally see those on our maps that are all colored in, right? So the middle of the country is this vast area that is finally getting attention um, at the policy level. And I just want to uh, mention uh, our, our most recent study um, with uh, Cliff Roski, and uh, Jody was involved in this, and Christy Mallory, and um, another uh, colleague back at UMass, Jenny Smith, um, that looked at data in Utah. Uh, that was collected by Equality Utah, and we analyzed it for them to find out what the experiences of discrimination are. And again, it's no big surprise, we found that there is a lot of discrimination against LGBT people in Utah. So just to kind of present the basic findings to you, again, almost, uh, almost half of lesbian, gay, and bisexual people in this survey reported they had experienced some form of discrimination. Um, and, uh, and almost an equal number weren't really sure, which you know, kind of gives you a sense of how hard it is to actually get reliable measures. But at the very least, what this tells us is that a lot of people think they've been discriminated against, and they might actually want to have some method for, uh, for legal recourse. Um, there was a very small transgender sample, uh, but uh, of that small sample, two-thirds of people reported some discrimination. So it, it kind of, it's, a, it's a nice framing of the idea that the rates that we're seeing for transgender people in reports of discrimination are higher than for lesbian, gay, and bisexual people. Um, uh, and then just as a reminder of why, uh, uh, of all the different effects that this kind of discrimination has, one important one is that it keeps people uh, in the closet because of fear. Uh, so we, uh, the survey asked people whether they feared discrimination, and again, many people do. So discrimination has an effect on those who face the discrimination and on those who, who, who fear it overall. So that's just kind of an example of surveys that are still popping up in lots of different places. We don't get involved with all of them we did in this particular case. Um, the next thing I want to do is just to give you a quick update on things that we've talked about at prior um, at prior uh, conferences around um, another common form of 
evidence about discrimination that economists and sociologists use related to wage gaps. We uh, see for women and people of color, discrimination results in lower wages. So does that happen for uh, lesbian, gay, and bisexual people? Well, with an exception of a study that Kristen's done, we don't really have a study like this for transgender people. Um, and so here's another interesting twist that I'll just tell you. We have some studies actually from some other countries um, that uh, turn out to be remarkably similar in many ways to the findings of US studies. So here's a study of couples in the UK uh, a couple of years back. That, uh, so sometimes we have couples data, sometimes individual data. I'm not going to talk a lot about methods, but, um, but they do vary somewhat here. And basically, they found what we often find in the US, which is that gay men earn less than uh, heterosexual men, measuring sexual orientation in those different ways. Uh, couples or individuals, and lesbian and bisexual women actually tend to often are seen to earn more than comparable heterosexual women. So we see this in the UK. We see something slightly different in Sweden, uh, looking at couples there. Uh, again, gay male couples see a sizable disadvantage, although actually in this case there is no disadvantage or advantage for, for women, for lesbians. Um, in Australia, Kit Carpenter had some really interesting data for just this really narrow slice of lesbians and found actually, though, that in the Australian case that, uh, that the lesbians earned quite a bit less than similar heterosexual women. They also reported more harassment and other kinds of economic challenges like unemployment uh, more frequently than did the heterosexual women in the sample. Um, in Canada, we go back to the same old pattern from before um, where uh, gay men earn significantly less and lesbians a bit more than heterosexual women. So it's, it's very interesting to me uh, what these commonalities, these commonalities pop up across countries. Actually, a study I didn't mention that's older uh, from the Netherlands actually shows the same kind of pattern for young uh, LGB people. Um, so we see similar wage patterns, but we see some other kinds of similarities, similarities that are interesting. This one's not so surprising that child rearing is lower for LGBT people, and yet there still are people that we can see in these couples and these individuals who do have children. And again, not surprisingly, lesbians are more likely to have kids than gay men, but both of those uh, groups are less likely to have them than are heterosexual people. We also see similar uh, sexual orientation differences in that gay people have higher levels of education in all of these surveys and in just about every one that's ever been done in the US. And uh, that one's kind of surprising and interesting. We haven't done very much with that. Um, the other one that's not so surprising is that we also see many more LGB people in urban areas, again, across countries. Um, and then finally, I'll just just to sound like a scientist, I'll say, make a methodological point here, <laughs> that we now have a couple of studies that suggest that in the US and in Canada and uh, in particular, that it's clear that you do have to be careful in using data on couples to say something about all LGB uh, people, that sometimes the wage gaps are actually higher for couples than they are when you look at people who are uh, uh, outside of couples as well as those in couples. So in the US, just to give you a quick update, we, we continue to see uh, similar patterns, looking at somewhat more recent data from uh, more, the more recent census, updates to the General Social Survey. Um, again, we're mostly seeing lesbians earning more and gay men earning less. And the actual uh, amounts vary uh, from study to study, but that pattern has been very consistent over time. So the last thing I want to just mention is something that's, I don't know, puzzled me and a lot of other people is why, is the, why do lesbians seem to earn more in many of these studies? This lesbian wage premium, is it really an advantage? We should all start putting it on our resumes. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to just kind of take us through a couple of um, things that people have, at, have, have hypothesized about why this might happen. Is it because we're less likely to have kids? Well, it turns out we are less likely to have kids, but that doesn't really explain the, the lesbian wage uh, premium. Um, and in fact, the premium is higher for those with children, which is kind of unusual, usually sort of the reverse of the pattern for heterosexual women. Is it that lesbians have a stronger commitment to the labor market? This, I think, is where we have the strongest evidence from patterns that you can kind of tease out uh, the importance of, uh, of um, this kind of commitment. Lesbians have higher returns to potential experience. Um, um, and for, uh, let's see. Yeah, I guess that's, uh, that's, that's the main thing. This, these other little points here, which I don't have time to go into, basically I'll just kind of reinforce that. But the idea is that uh, we don't have good measures of experience on these surveys. Um, so we're just kind of looking at the years that people might have been working um, after they got out of school. But for heterosexual women, those tend to not be very good measures because they may take time out of the labor force to raise kids. Lesbians are less likely to do that. And if they have a stronger commitment to staying in the labor force, then they're gonna be a better measure for 
lesbians, and you'll see a higher return to having more of those years of potential experience in the labor market. And that's indeed what we find, which does suggest that lesbians are spending more, more time in the labor market. Another interesting idea that people have asked is that, that lesbians, are, are they free from gender roles that are restrictive for heterosexual women? And we do actually see a little bit of evidence that this may be also creating the lesbian wage premium. Actually, Mike Steinberger uh, wrote an interesting paper with some colleagues, one of our uh, policy fellows, uh, former policy fellows, um, that, uh, be, that shows very clearly that, clearly that lesbians are more likely to be in male-dominated occupations or to occupations with more men in them, and that does account for at least a part of the lesbian wage premium, but not actually a very large part, but at least it's a little bit of the story. Uh, another more recent study that kind of got published a few years ago, but suddenly it was all over the blogosphere a few months ago, I don't know why, maybe you saw this, uh, a study that showed that lesbian, comparing the wage premium for lesbians who were never married, and therefore maybe never making uh, decisions um, around men, um, compared to lesbians who had been previously married to a man, and the lesbian wage premium was actually uh, much um, smaller for the ones who had been previously married. So that premium seems to largely go with having been single and, or at least not um, married to a man. So we're starting to get some, um, uh, some interesting, I'm gonna I have some other points I could have made but don't have time, but we're starting to kind of dig a little bit into the data to try to really squeeze out as much as we possibly can. But let me just say that I think, um, just to kind of come back to what I started with, I think this suggests that we need to do, to try some new methods because we're running out of things we can squeeze out of the existing data uh, to tell us about discrimination. So I'm hoping that you know scholars out in the audience who are looking for uh, interesting questions will find them and will also look for interesting new methods to address those questions. Thanks. Great. Well, and um, I, again, it's, it's interesting. I, I know that I got um, invited here um, because of my work with you know, current work with EEOC, but I do have to say that my previous hat of doing workplace flexibility issues for the last seven years um, is quite relevant to this. Um, because I think in terms of future research, um, uh, one of the main things that people are struggling with in the workplace flexibility field is the pay equity question. Um, and uh, people like Bob Drago's work showing that it's mothers who make less, not women, um, is, is what I thought about initially when you were saying the lesbian wage premium. But I think what it's clearly also showing is the intersection between gender roles, work, family, et cetera. Um, and I, I do think that I could imagine in a year or two a, a something that the Williams Institute brings together um, uh, people like Pamela Stone and Bob Drago and Kathleen Gerson, whom I don't think I've ever thought about what the lesbian wage premium or gay men earning less might be able to teach us about the workplace generally. So. Um, well, as a way of rounding out um, this, we are um, going to hear from Professor um, Marika um, Clowater, Clowater. Um, who has looked at impact of different social policies, whether it's child support policies, welfare policies, or anti-discrimination laws based on sexual orientation on issues of um, income and uh, economic security. So, Marika. Good, thank you very much. It's uh, so wonderful to be here and, and hear everyone's research and, and talk to everyone. It's just been wonderful. Um, and uh, to have to start with my joke, which is I always say that uh, having a kid is something for me, I figure, uh, I'm an economist, um, a four hour tax per day on my time that could be devoted to research and squeezing out, as Lisa, squeezing out a little bit more from those data. But, um, and it's also as an economist, the, the value added, my utility, marginal utility of those four hours is huge and I'm very willingly pay it. But uh, uh, I'm here to squeeze with four hours less per day. 
Um, so, yes, I'm going to talk about anti-discrimination policies for sexual orientation, specifically looking at um, policies addressing employment and discrimination in employment. There's other kinds of anti-discrimination policies for sexual orientation, including um, in education, public accommodations, and other aspects. But I'm going to focus on the, the employment aspects today. Um, these were first adopted in the early 70s, starting in some very small towns, usually college towns, and I'll talk a little bit about the types of places that adopted these policies and show you lots of pictures since it's getting towards the end of the conference and pictures might uh, keep you awake. Um, so these are really important. They're really important for individuals, regardless of how I squeeze the data and show that they do or don't have an impact overall. They're really important for individuals to have the option to go somewhere and say, I've been discriminated against, and, and I want you to do something about it. Um, but what you're going to see most of me doing today is talking about how the policies might be important beyond the individuals who use them, who bring complaints. Because the policies do some other things, um, including hopefully discourage discrimination in hiring, in firing, in wages, in promotions. And by discouraging discrimination, by creating penalties or increasing salience of the idea that, that treating people differently by sexual orientation is discrimination, it may be that everyone is better off, all gays and lesbians, all sexual minorities, um, become better off. And that might increase, might increase average earnings overall um, relative to what um, Lee was showing over there for some of the wage gaps, especially for men. I'm going to talk about uh, two different kinds of, of anti-discrimination policies for employment. Some just cover government employees, and I'm going to call these kind of public sector employment um, policies. Um, and these are important, and I think um, some of the Williams Institute research has shown there is still discrimination among government employees. Um, they might be less important than the policies that cover private sector employment for a number of reasons. One is there's fewer government workers than private sector employers. Also, these uh, public sector laws, or actually, they're usually executive orders rather than legislation. And um, that process might create less salience, less changing of public norms than if a law is actually legislated and passed and creates more salience around the issue. Um, so the pol public sector policies might have less of an impact on overall earnings for gays and lesbians than do the private sector employment policies. So um, here's what I'm going to talk about really quickly uh, with my pictures, mostly. Um, uh, one thing is just how many of these policies are there in the US? Where have the policies been passed? And having an RA who does GIS work has allowed me to do the maps there. Um, what factors affect to help explain the passage of these policies? And this is drawing on literature, um, mostly by political scientists. And then where most of my work is, um, is talking about what the impact of these policies are uh, primarily on, on earnings for gays and lesbians. So this graph shows over time from 1974 over here on the left to um, well into 2010 how many local policies, so city or county policies, have been passed for sexual orientation. The red area on the bottom is the number of private policies, um, and the blue on top is the number of public sector government um, employee policies. So by 2010, there's almost uh, about 200 um, private sector policies, and um, there's another 100 um, public sector policies. I should say the private sector policies also cover government workers. Um, so they're covered as well on those red policies. So there's been a huge increase over time. Um, and it's been a pretty steady increase since the early 70s. Um, this graphic is similar. It shows the state-level policies, and now there's, I think, 21 states and D.C. have state-level anti-discrimination policies for private sector workers. And then you see on top of that, there's still more states that have policies covering their government workers. And I should say there's um, probably, I'll talk more about this in the passage, a lot of places pass, uh, have an executive order covering government employees, and then later pass private sector employers. So there might be some softening up that happens by having these public sector um, laws in place. 
adding another color here. Um, this shows uh, what percentage of the U.S. population is covered by the local and state policies. So the red on the bottom here are state level policies, how many people are covered by those, and you see some big jumps there in the, uh, I think it's 92 where California passed their policy. Um, so you see a lot of people covered there, that's important. Um, the yellow area here are people who are covered, what proportion of the population is covered by both state and local policies. Um, and then the top area is, uh, uh, is how many people are covered just by local policies. This could be really important because state level policies generally have more enforcement and better implementation processes than do the local policies, which in some cases have absolutely no enforcement mechanisms um, in place. They still may be very important, again, at creating salience, um, creating, uh, changing local norms, um, as, and being symbolic acts in that sense. Um, and obviously, some people are only covered by local policies. And now here are my maps. And this is where my uh, research assistant got very excited. Um, this is the policies as of 1980. And so you can see there were no states yet um, that had policies. The, um, the size of the bubbles are the, uh, n the population size in the local areas. And again, the red policies here are covering both public and private um, sector employees. And the blue ones are covering only um, public sector workers. So you can see there's just a smattering of policies out there in 1980. Um, this is 1990, and now you can see some states have adopted. Wisconsin's in there with a private sector policy, the very first one in 1982, and then a number of states that have also, um, at this point, have the public sector uh, protections. I have to say, uh, looking at this graph, I did my first work on the effect of policies with the 1990 census, um, working on it in the mid-90s, and this is what I was working with. I just redid some of that analysis, and I was like, how could I even expect to find an impact of the policies given what was out there, which was not that much. So this is 1990, 2000, you can see quite a number of states now had private sector policies, the red, and more in the middle of the country, it's kind of moving. Uh, political scientists, I think it was Jack Water Walker, um, talks about policy diffusion as this spreading ink blot. So looking at these maps, I think there's a spreading ink blot, and it spreads from the sides, though, into the middle here. And here's the last one, 2010, and you can see a good portion of the country, that was over 50% of the population, are now covered by these policies. Um, there are just, I think, uh, I was looking with someone, maybe two states that have no po uh, population covered, because, by local policies at least, but quite a number of states now have private sector um, policies. So I just want to say a little bit about the literature on these policies. As I said, I'm first going to talk about um, where they get adopted. Um, what feeds into that. Um, first of all, there's political factors. Um, uh, uh, and some of these may have changed over time. Most of this literature is talking about those policies that happened before and the adoptions that happened before 1990. And it may be different given changes in public opinion. Um, so the political factors, in general, in the beginning it was good if there was very limited debate and low salience before adoption. Um, so that was important. Certainly policy entrepreneurs, people who took it on, advocates were all important. Uh, Lee pointed to some of the demographic factors um, that more highly educated people, um, more urban people, less religious populations were important in adoptions. Um, and in general, these were adopted in, in places where wages were higher for everyone. So I'm going to skip here. Um, so what are the uh, impacts? Some people have shown that the rates of using complaints under these are pretty similar for sexual minorities as for other groups, women and, and racial ethnic minorities. Um, uh, it looks like, given work that, that I've done, that Gary Gates have done, has done on the impacts, looking at wage gaps, like Lee pointed out, it looks like the state policies may have an effect on earnings for gays and lesbians, increasing them, especially for men, but um, the local policies don't look like they're effective in, in average earnings overall, as opposed to individuals. Um, my recent work suggested that the impacts might be limited to people, um, who, uh, white men working in the private sector, not in other kinds of jobs, not profits or government. It might be working on expanding employment opportunity, uh, opportunity through works, weeks of work. 
and they might be most effective for those at the higher end of the income distribution rather than the lower end. So just to wrap up, because I see I'm time, I feel like that moot court thing yesterday made me think, time, do I have permission to, to, to save two yes. more minutes? Yes, OK, you thank you, thank you. <laughs> rebuttal, rebuttal. <laughs> so it looks uh, traumatized by that. Um, <laughs> so. These laws continue to be adopted, and of course we're hoping for ENDA at the federal level. It would bring different enforcement mechanisms. It's likely to be more effective because it covers many more people, especially those in areas that weren't already gay-friendly. These have been adopted most often in places where it was already more gay-friendly on average than the places in that middle uh, section without red coloring uh, that haven't adopted them, them yet, so that's going to be important. Important. Um, it does look like state laws have been more effective than local laws. Um, and, dis and I think this is an important piece, uh, not a throwaway line at the end. These look like they've been most important um, laws for average earning for people who are already relatively advantaged in the job market. And so we need to think about other ways, and some of the discussion later pointed to this, it, for people in the job market who are on the poor end, on the lower end of the job scale, for people of color, uh, for women, and for other people who aren't at the higher ends of the, the income ladder already. Thank you. Okay, so we've got a good 20 minutes for questions and comments. Um, I expect us to use it. Um, if you, especially if you have a comment, um, a long comment, because we had some great comments at the end of the last session. I am not going to try to um, repeat those. If you just have a quick question, feel free to just ask it from your seat, and I'll repeat it. If you have a comment, and there should be lots of people in here who should have good comments, um, please just go to the microphone and give your comment there. Um, and um, uh, so that that can be fully captured. Um, so, Excellency Evan, and so let me just say this, is, e is Evan going to the microphone or going out? Yeah. He's just going out, oh my God. <laughs> okay, um, well let me make one, <laughs> Evan should think of a question while he's out. Um, now, um, and let me just make one comment as you, as you think about your questions and comments. Um, I do think the piece about education is really interesting, right? They're better educated, and I think about a, um, I was talking to two Latino men, um, one of whom worked at the EOC in a Texas office and, and the other his partner. Both of them were the first in their family to get a college education. And I asked them each why, and they said, well, it was clear to us, each of them had the same answer. It was clear to me growing up that I was gay, that I needed to get out, and the way I was gonna get out was through education. And so they got out. Right? Now, it's better to get education because you've been pulled to education as opposed to pushed to it, right? But again, think about what we can perhaps offer to the wider education community conversation. Because as you heard from Andy in the last panel, you know, you have a college education, the divorce rate is much lower. <laughs> If you have a college education, part of that is that you're more likely to be better employed and it all comes back to having a job and having economic security. So while there are things that work against us as gay people, there are things that actually are clearly, we are making it work for us. And let me tell you, this country could use us then in terms of some of the things that we have to say and in and, and terms of increasing job, um, both education and jobs. So, okay, go ahead. I'm just sitting here Could trying to... Could you introduce to... yourself and just for those... Oh, yeah. My name is Jamie Hall. I'm a land use attorney, actually. But um, I'm just sitting here thinking, why is it that gay couples are reporting, I guess, that they're making less money? Um, and I'm trying to think about why that might be. I, I thought of two potential answers. One maybe is that um, you said that lesbian women are more likely to go into male-dominated fields. Well, maybe gay men are more likely to go into female-dominated fields. And therefore, be if we know that there's this inequity between the gender incomes, that they necessarily make less money. The other answer could potentially be that um, their employers see them more like, I, I, I don't, they perceive them not as masculine, more as feminine, and therefore, for whatever reason, they're they're getting 
the same gender inequity um, as far as income is concerned. I don't know, what are some answers to this thing? I'm just perplexed. Ah, well, <laughs> yeah, actually, it, it, you're right about uh, gay men are also in jobs that are, that have more women in them, fewer men and more women, and that's a very clear predictor of, of income. That Mike's study showed that as well. Although in the case of men, it didn't explain very much of the, the wage gap for them. And it is still, you know, difficult to explain for, uh, for gay men. Uh, the, um, the other overarching explanation is that, um, Maybe like lesbians who are more committed to the workforce because they know they won't have a man to provide for them, that gay men know they don't have to provide for a woman who's expected to stay at home. So they may make less, uh, uh, fewer investments in what economists call human capital, the, the commitment to the workforce, training, education. Um, and that's why you know, they're, they're earning less because of um, uh, those kinds of choices. I mean. We don't have good data on that. I mean, I'm personally skeptical of that argument because the education rates are so much higher. It looks like, if anything, that uh, the gay men are getting higher levels, choosing to get higher levels of human capital. So, so it is a puzzle, and I think as long as we kind of limit ourselves to these data sets, we're not going to be able to figure that out. Um, I think, uh, um, in, in my mind, one of the, you know, there's lots of promising at it. Um, uh, approaches to studying these, but one that hasn't really been used very thoroughly is to go into places of employment and do um, surveys and field work and observations and interviews to, to figure out you know, what is actually going on in those kinds of workplaces where you can see where gay men end up or lesbians end up. Can I just add one more thing to that? And that is, um, yeah, in my recent work, I did look at weeks of work and hours, hours of work by gay men, and it, they were lower than for heterosexual men. Um, but also, the wages per hour were lower for gay men than for heterosexual men. So, th and and I know Lee, you were talking about kind of a cumulative job experience, and we generally don't have good measures of those. The other piece um, co comes from kind of the labor economics literature, this idea of a marriage bonus. And it points to a, com a couple of things. I think people haven't gotten rid of that yet. The idea that married men do uh, earn more on average than other men, um, and it can't be explained just by education or the other characteristics we have data on. And that could be something about employers thinking thinking kind of this family wage idea that, that men should be, who are married should be paid more because they have to provide for a family some way. So that idea of gender roles might uh, come in there. Yeah. Hi, um, when uh, Kristen was uh, talking about the salience effects of, of the various laws, I think it was you, um, it, got, it occurred to me that in addition to the very existence of the laws, it's also important how well they're enforced, or whether they're enforced for that matter. And is there any data that anyone can talk about as to the impact of anti-discrimination laws either for gays and lesbians or for transgenders when they're well enforced versus when they're not well enforced? Or if, for example, there's a change of administration in a particular state from a, an administration that's friendly toward those laws to one that's not so friendly toward those laws, is there anything, any information that can be can be cited about that. Yeah, I guess um, I'm an economist. We don't have data on enforcement. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, it's difficult. Um, it is difficult. I think there, is, there are a couple studies of the number of complaints brought under laws, and that is a crude measure, but again, it's kind of a, like crime statistics or something. It's hard to know kind of what creates complaints. Is it good enforcement creates more complaints um, because people know how to bring them and are willing to bring them because they think they'll be effective? Um, so I th I've seen a little bit of qualitative research around the sexual orientation policies by some political scientists, even just looking at what the enforcement mechanisms are. But I haven't seen anyone actually track that and match that to any kind of, of effectiveness of the laws. Yeah, I know there's a literature on, uh, you know, on affirmative action and race and gender laws, and they are sensitive to enforcement levels, although it's all it's fairly crudely measured. But I, actually, the experience of getting some of the information for the big ENDA project 
um, was very interesting because we, um, you know, Christy and the other folks were contacting all these enforcement agencies and in some cases they didn't return phone calls, they didn't, couldn't tell us the number of complaints, they, in some cases it wasn't clear they were even fully, they didn't really know they were supposed to be collecting complaints <laughs> like that. I mean, literally. I mean, that's more, less true at the state level, obviously, than at some of the localities. Are there, are there other things you guys would add to that? The vast majority is what I want to add. Yeah. Very few actually got back to me with any sort of response. They Even refer people to the EEOC. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that, I mean, it's a, it's a great question because it shows that there's a lot we don't know. Thank you. Yeah. Can I, I, I'd just like to add to that a little bit. I, in my dissertation work, I looked at um, the enforcement of gender identity protections in Washington, D.C., and I actually took a survey and specifically asked about experiences in public accommodations after the um, adoption of explicit public accommodations protections in D.C., and 70% of my sample had been denied access to a place of public accommodation or harassed or physically attacked in a place of public accommodation. So there's a whole, luckily there's a local activist group that works on enforcement issues and the situation is getting better, but enforcement is definitely key to making these laws make a difference in people's day-to-day -day lives. Thanks. I just wanted to speak to the wage differences also. Um, I spent six years working at a corporate law firm and I thought, you know, you we were talking about maybe looking into different contexts. Um, it's only one firm, but it was one of the major firms in the country. And what's interesting is that there were no gay males to this day. There's no gay male who started at that firm who was openly gay and made it up to partnership. There are a number of partners who are gay, but they came to the firm with a nice book of business. The only female partner in the real estate department, which is a largely male dominated environment, is a lesbian. And so I was always observing that it seemed that the lesbians, open lesbians in our part in our firm, the managing partner of the LA office is also an open lesbian. So it seemed to me that gay men, and I felt like I was hitting a glass ceiling as I became a senior associate. I'm now the deputy executive director at the ACLU, so I've got a great job. And thanks to, <laughs> to all of you here and to Chuck Williams for this fabulous institute and Brad for all your work that's helped all of our work so much. But I certainly think it would be interesting to research the law firms and the limitation. And also would say that when I was interviewing a transgender applicant a few years ago, we couldn't find a transgender partner at a major firm anywhere in the country. So I wanted to ask about um, both in the data and in the statutes and the ordinances that you've looked at, um, differences between transsexuals and discrimination against transsexuals and discrimination against uh, transgender people more generally or gender nonconforming, particularly because I do a lot of advocacy work for ordinances in Utah and the issues that we face are the same issues that you face advocating for ENDA on dress codes and bathrooms and exemptions for those, right? And so by including an exemption for dress codes, one protects the way those are structured. They protect transsexuals, but cross-dressers sort of lost in the political trade-off. So I'm just wondering what the data says about discrimination, um, either against transsexuals versus cross-dressing and nonconformity, and also how many of these ordinances actually include exemptions for dress codes and bathrooms and, and stuff like that? Well, I can. Um, the large report has actually breakdowns um, people who identify transgender versus gender nonconforming in their experiences. Um, in employment, but we don't look specifically at transsexuality versus transgender versus gender nonconformity in this report. I, I know that, um, and I'm probably not answering your question, I'm also not a lawyer, so I'm I, um, probably not going to get at what you uh, are curious about, but uh, it seems to me that in um, anti-discrimination protections on based on gender identity or expression, there's um, kind of a disconnect um, between what that means and healthcare coverage, because um, not all trans people want to transition, right. which is what a lot of people indicate by saying transsexual, is that the you want to undergo a medical transition. Um, so when you get into issues of healthcare coverage at work, then it gets to be a little bit um, more tricky, and it, it's, um, debatable whether gender identity or expression, you know, reaches into actual access to, to health care. So, 
So let me actually, I, I think that as the one lawyer on this panel, um, just say a few things, both about your question and then also about things that people said before, um, that maybe because someone's more acting like a girl, that a gay man is gonna be paid less, or the glass ceiling piece. Um, one of the things that's very important to remember is that under current gender discrimination law, if you are treated poorly as a guy because you're acting more feminine, or treated poorly as a woman because you're acting too masculine, you're protected under current law. There is no ban against gay people using that protection. Now, what often happened, and in fact, the key case, Price Waterhouse and Hopkins, the key Supreme Court case that established this point that sex stereotyping in this way is a violation of Title VII, I remember when I met Ann Hopkins, I thought, oh yeah, because she just looked totally like a butch lesbian to me. And, but when she said, hi, I'm Hannah Hopkins, and like her third sentence was, and I'm, I'm straight, and those are my three kids out there. And I thought, oh, now I get it. A, that's why she brought the case, because she was pissed you know, that she'd been, not been given partner at this Price Waterhouse firm, and she wasn't a lesbian, you know? So, because if she had been a lesbian, A, maybe she wouldn't have brought the case, or B, she could have been thrown out because the court would have said, oh, really what you're arguing about is sexual orientation, as opposed to the gender stereotyping, okay? So, the key lesson for gay people today is that if you are a gay person who is not gender conforming, you have protection under current law, not because you're gay, but because you're gender non-conforming. And um, I watched, it just this is like a, two weeks ago, at this major legal conference, uh, and they were talking about protection for gay people and transgender people under existing law, and the management lawyer showed the deposition which I guess was allowed because it's maybe a public thing, but show the deposition, it killed me. This poor, this poor guy who was in this deposition had no clue that you know 100 lawyers were now looking at him. But anyway, it was a guy in California was claiming discrimination based on sexual orientation because it was California, was bringing it under both state law and federal. Under federal, you know, he'd been called Tinkerbell and you know, these various other things by his coworkers. So in the deposition, he comes in, number one, with a baseball cap and a T-shirt, and the lawyer, the management lawyer is saying, so do you consider yourself not masculine? And it's like, no, I know, um, you know what I mean? Like, or do you think you were being um, harassed because you weren't masculine enough? No, I mean, cause you know, he's just, he's thinking, it's you know, I was called fag, I was called Tinkerbell, that's all gay, right? And so the court threw out the Title VII claim, kept in the state law claim, as opposed to, if what he had said, both in the deposition, all this, if you forget about the fact that I was called fag and I was just called Tinkerbell, right? Mm -hmm. That's, the fact that I'm gay is not relevant to the gender conformity issue. Okay, so all that is to say that I do think we need to be looking more closely in the employment settings about what is going on for folks and we need to make it clear that gay people don't lose protection under Title VII that everyone else has. Um, I don't necessarily think, yeah, and then the, the other thing that was clear on this panel was very interesting was that how transgender people actually had more protection under Title VII right now um, in those cases where courts would ac acknowledge that changing their gender was discrimination based on sex. Again, not, not all courts have accepted that obviously, but the, it, it, you didn't have to necessarily go to the gender stereotyping piece for transgender people. Um, so, so then, in, so in terms of the question of the, uh, you know, you can have dress codes, right? Under Title VII, they allow those things, but you you can't, in fact, um, you know, discriminate against a man for being too feminine. I mean, that's the irony right now in Title VII. You can have a dress code, but you can't discriminate against being So it's just a somewhat confused part of the law at the moment, so. Hi, um, regarding the gay male wage gap, I'm wondering, uh, although the panel might not be able to answer, whether people have looked at uh, things like minority stress and bullying and harassment in schools and educational achievement, Certainly as a psychologist working with high school students, I see that 
gay and lesbian students seem to have a much harder time making it through successfully because of the environments in some of the schools. And I'm wondering if this educational component might not contribute to the wage gap that's found. Yeah, that, I think that's a great question. We don't really, we haven't linked those two things that we've talked a lot about in the literatures um, in different fields, and maybe that's why. The economist talking about the wage gaps and the psychologists and sociologists talking about what happens to gay kids in schools before they get to college. So maybe there's a, you know, they're not inconsistent. You could have a bad experience in high school and sort of look to college as a way to, you know, sure. to redeem your, your career hopes or to get out of a bad situation, I suppose. But yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let me call on Jenny, who has a question now for the mic. Oh, go ahead. I just, no, sorry, I just wanted to yes. jump in on the last question really quickly. Um, in the, the, the national trans survey, what, what we found is that people, some people had left school because the harassment was so bad, but what you found was people going back to school later and actual, actually in, in the end, uh, higher rates of receiving college degrees and graduate degrees um, than the general population. But there is this kind of period of time where uh, some people left, but then returned later, later on, so that is a possibility. Jenny? No, I, I was just remembering on the point about um, wage, higher wages correlating to marriage, remembering a number of years ago seeing some studies, including uh, the book that was done by Annette Prescott and Sharon Silverstein when they were still talking to each other, that was, I think, not methodologically sound, but was interesting survey results they got from Harvard Business School graduates, where I recall a number of people in their surveys reporting um, that what they observed as sort of a ceiling was coworkers getting promotions because it seemed as though those making the decisions correlated marriage to stability, and then the certain sort of looking in the mirror, recognizing competence in someone that looks like you, sort of classic kind of discrimination dynamics, which it just seems to me it calls for that much more of a qualitative research to, to examine that, and especially what the effects might be as legal options are changing uh, for, for same-sex couples or people in a same-sex relationship whether that plays out or doesn't play out because the, because the employee looking for the promotion would still, in important ways, look different from the person who's making the hiring decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, and then, Naomi, you're standing there. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I have two, two ideas. One is that I understand it's very difficult yeah. to get at how much discrimination is being prevented by these laws. Um, but it, it may be considerably easier to get at things like how much effect, how much health effect do these laws have? There may be other measures we can use that, that, are, that are easier to get a hold of. Um, and related to that is I'm all for end up, especially trans and post but, uh, but it makes me worry about it, are we going to, Imposing that federally on Arkansas, Montana, and Wyoming, is that going to have the, is, is the law itself going to have the effect, or is it the effect of the coalitions and the political will coming together at a local level that supports that law happening in that place? And I'm particularly interested in Puerto viewpoint on I think there's pretty good evidence um, from the experience with women and um, racial minorities that actually having the federal law did have an impact, especially in areas that weren't covered earlier by state laws, for example. So I think that probably it would have an important, and remember the offsetting is the laws are already in place in more gay friendly um, and presumably trans friendly areas. So that, and the race and gender piece, those laws were more effective in places where there was more discrimination to begin with. Okay, we are actually three minutes over our time, but um, I think since the two of you stood up, if each of you would just say your comments or questions, and then we'll continue the conversation over our lunches. So I'm kind of fascinated about the what I see is more misogyny and racism in some of the work, like Marika, yours about kind of who the non-discrimination is helping, and then also Jody with like the interesting race stuff. So I'm wondering, Kristen, in your work, especially as you're moving towards trans women 
whether you're going to see differences kind of about transitioning from a woman to a man versus a man to a woman and, and the misogyny role that I see, especially with gay men and the issues that they're facing versus, you know, maybe women and lesbians in the workplace acting more like men and maybe having a boost for that reason. So I'm just curious kind of what you think you are going to find or what you're already finding. Um, so that's actually what I look at in the last chapter of my book is that, um, you know, particularly white trans men and white trans women have very different experiences. The extremes are different. So for white trans men, particularly those who work in professional jobs, um, you know, coworkers might not have ever thought about it, but they also are able to say things, particularly uh, straight white men, well, why wouldn't you want to be a man? And I mean, I know it sounds laughable, but that's sort of the way that people think about it, right? Like, well, um, you know, people would say, you know, he was a really unattractive woman, so it didn't surprise me that he wanted to be a man. Or, you know, I already perceived him as looking like a man, so he might as well just become one. Whereas trans women, particularly if they were gender conforming as males prior to announcing the transition, so if people perceived them as just one of the guys who was kind of like, you know, the guy you go out with to have drinks with, people had an incredibly negative reaction. It would say things like, well, why would you be a second class citizen? You know, or would think, you know, this person was insane, or, um, you know, had a really difficult time understanding that. And so you do see some, some really clear differences there. Uh, and lastly, uh, getting back to gay men making less, uh, I think there's some data that the more assertive you are at work, the more effective you are in going up and you know, asking for raises, asking for promotion. And if you think about stereotyping, to some degree, gay men who may have been bullied and are somewhat reluctant to take on a male boss, and of course, lesbians are pretty tough ladies, right? And they may be more willing to do that. So I think it comes down perhaps to personalities uh, and might be worth looking at as a possibility. I'm Robert Morris, by the way, from the Department of Pediatrics. You were supposed to know who I was. Thanks. Oh, yes, and thank you for introducing yourself because Robert has a totally awesome niece named Kate who is marrying, right? Don't you have... Yes, and she's marrying a totally awesome guy, Pierce Blue, who worked for me for two years. So <laughs> look at that. Um, all right, so um, I, I actually, the other thing that's, I think, great, Robert, about that last, and it also fits in with ch looking at the health impacts and stuff, that there's, I really do want to urge, as a closing piece here, um, reaching out, and I didn't know I would do this when I started this panel, reaching out to the family work community of academics, because number one, that is a community that is very interdisciplinary already because of the work, the funding that the Sloan Foundation, Foundation did for the last 20 years. And for example, they have experience now, some of these folks, Lottie Bale and others, of going into the workplace, doing a study inside a workplace, which is an entire methodology piece that is, you know, important. Um, and I, I really, really do think that we can learn from them and they can learn from us. So on that note, I want to thank this fantastic panel and all of you.